Hey, this is Ryan Mundy, eight-year veteran of the NFL and also Super Bowl champion. Now I am currently founder and CEO of Alchemy Health, and this is The Game Plan. Ryan Mundy, thank you so much for joining us on The Game Plan today. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be with you both. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, we want to dig into, obviously, the amazing work that you're doing with Alchemy and your journey to it. But I think before we jump into it, for some context for our listeners, talk to us a little bit about when you started thinking about life after football and what came next for you. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I started thinking about life after football as soon as I got into it, uh, specifically the NFL. Uh, I remember very uh clearly mike and i got drafted by the steelers in 2008 and i remember very clearly that mike tomlin told our our rookie cohort that um football is not who you are it's what you do and so his message there was saying that you need to think about life outside of the game uh famous fleeting and just like you came into the nfl you can quickly be out of the nfl and, you know, as a, as a rookie, I'm like, man, I don't know what you're talking about. I'm about to be here forever. I'm about to make all this money and then life is going to be great. Uh, but I can tell you for sure that eight years uh, and I played eight years professionally goes by extremely quickly. And for the reality is that uh, for most guys in the NFL, they don't even make it to three. That's the average. And so it was always on my radar uh, to think about life after uh, I started to take advantage of educational opportunities that were afforded by the NFL. Uh, I went to uh, executive education uh, um, programs at Wharton, uh, Notre Dame. Uh, I got my MBA at the University of Miami, Florida during my seventh and eighth year. So towards, towards the tail end uh, of my career, but I was always like preparing for, for life after uh, because I didn't want to football to define me, but I knew it was a great platform and a springboard into new, uh, the next chapter of my life. Yeah, that's one of the, the big differences I think we hear from athletes that have played, I'd say in the last decade or so versus some of the, you know, the older retired athletes that come on the show is that there is this wealth of knowledge that is available to you now. When you think about your time in the league, uh, were guys in the locker room really talking about, hey, this is what I'm doing off the field. I'm doing this investing stuff. I wanna be an entrepreneur. Or is that something that's you know really more recently you're seeing people talk about? Uh, I think that's very recent. Uh, when I say very recent, probably within the last five years. Um, I came into the league in 2008. So Instagram was not around. Twitter was barely getting off of the ground. Facebook was used in the whole, it had a whole different use case. Um, and I think with the rise of all the, the social media platforms that um, has amplified the athlete opportunity to create brand and off field opportunities. Um, and so when I first started, guys weren't talking about, you know, how to leverage their celebrity, quote celebrity off the field. You know, it was all about, you know, ball, you know, hanging out a little bit. You might have a guy or two talking a little bit about real estate and some investment properties, but, you know, as far as it relates to um, private equity opportunities or even venture capital, that was very much so foreign territory, um, really throughout my entire career. I didn't know, I didn't actually, I didn't know what the hell venture capital was until I retired. Uh, and I retired in 2015 and just happened to, to stumble into it. Uh, and that's why I say that five year period is, is really where things started to heat up uh, for athletes as a whole in the category. Yeah, let's talk about that a little bit more in your interest in venture capital. You'd launched a fund called Techly. And what really drew you into investment and particularly VC style investments? Yeah, so it wasn't a fun. It was just me and my own money. Uh, <laughs> but nonetheless, it was just a good way for me to kind of brand my investment activity. And just a little context there, like when I retired, I knew nothing about it, um, but I was willing and ready to learn. I had an MBA in my hand. I said, I want to get into this. You know, and this was at a time where Kobe was garnering some headlines around what he was doing, Steph Curry, Andre Iguodala, et cetera. And I was like, all right, this is cool. Uh, I don't have as much money as these guys, so I need to figure out how I'm going to best play this game. Um, but eventually, you know, build up my network, access resources, and got to an inflection point and said, you know, do I want to go and work somewhere or do I want to kind of, you know, do my own thing? 
And obviously I chose the latter, uh, a high degree of hubris with that. Uh, but I did it nonetheless, and it was a great experience. Um, but I think at that time, the thought process was, you know, what what's necessary to, to be, quote, successful in venture capital? Net, capital, network, access, and reach. And I felt like I had all of those. And so that was a big driver behind my decision-making process um, to go out there and, and be like a, a mercenary angel investor, if you will. Um, a lot of lessons learned. <laughs> Would I advise that? Uh, that's not a path for everybody, um, but it is one that ultimately shaped me and got me to where I am today, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Well, it's interesting because we've had a lot of guests on the game plan, and uh, Matthew Delavadova actually comes to mind because he's pretty active as an angel investor, and one of the key learnings he had that he just shared very candidly with us was to write smaller checks. And you know, he maybe got over his skis a little bit on some of the investing he was doing. You did have those three things that you mentioned getting into the space, but what was maybe the most eye-opening thing for you once you started to either invest or consider investments? Um, the most eye-opening thing during the whole process was like, one, like sourcing the deal, vetting the deal, and then getting over that hurdle. And then there's like volume with it too, right? So like as a one man shop, I'm doing everything, soup to nuts. So if you get an email from me or a calendar invite from me, that is literally from me, right? I didn't have any assistance. So like just a sheer amount of workload managing my schedule, um, that was an eye opener because honestly, I never had to do that before. Like my schedule was always laid out for me, you know, boom, 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 show up and it's done. Um, but I took on everything uh, from from the get go. So that was the biggest eye opening eye opener for me. But the sheer I didn't if there was something that I underestimated, it was just the amount of shots that you got to kind of put up. And I think that's correlated to like writing smaller checks. Uh, exactly. You could get all starry eyed and say, oh, this is going to be great. I want to really, really want to press this. But it's like, now nah, play. you need to see about 10 or not even 10, like 50 more of these things. Uh, make sure that you're diversified, at least in your scope and in your approach um, and deal flow before, you know, you start to to really press down on things. And so taking smaller bets, making sure that, you know, your your quote, funnel uh, is active uh, and, and running. Um, those would all, all be important lessons uh, for me as well. And I'll be honest, maybe your experience is different because the nature of you having a public profile, being a professional athlete, but when I first got into in, in, to venture, one of the hardest things is saying no. And <laughs> like just, oh, I could see the vision or I could see the potential here. And then you, like that FOMO kicks in. And, you know, ideally that's coming out of the fact that you're seeing really good deals. But saying no is actually really hard. And I think an underrated thing from an investor perspective. No one's going to have sympathy for that, <laughs> but I think it's a very real thing. Yeah, I think. And then I would just double down and say, have a quick no. Like if it's be fast with it. Don't waste your time or the entrepreneur's time, you know, trying to draw things out or, you know, string them along. Like if it ain't it, it ain't it. Uh, and, you know, being transparent and upfront with that is really important. And then also too, because you did mention like public profile is a whole different ball game with it, right? Because people want to, they want you to sit on these advisory boards and they want you to, you know, like do uh, appearances or speak on panels, et cetera. So, that was equally, uh, I guess the word is distracting. Like those are all shiny toys too. Like, oh, I'm on this advisory board and oh, I got to go to this conference and speak on that panel. Uh, in retrospect, I would cut out about half of that. Um, but again, it was, a, it was an important part of me just learning because I just dove right in. So I didn't know left from right. So I was willing uh, to go out there and, and spend some time and energy just going out there and figuring it out. Yeah, I think one of the things Tim and I talk about a lot is that inside of every venture capitalist is an entrepreneur that's trying to break out. And that's partly why we spend so much time with other entrepreneurs where we say, man, you know, I, I, I think I could do this, but I'm not sure. And so we, we you know, and, and I, Tim and I, partly why, why we do this show, why we enjoy doing is because it's like our little slice of entrepreneurship. Talk to us a little bit about what prompted you, you know, doing some investing, exploring and learning. What prompted you to then come to Alchemy Health and say, you know what, I'm going to get off the, the investing sidelines and actually get into the field. Well, there was even one step before that. So I started one company called Swizzle before I started Alchemy. 
And what prompted that decision is quite frankly, I needed to make some money. Uh, <laughs> again, like tech lead was me and my own money. And we talk about like the return cycle of venture, you know, there was going to be, if there was a return cycle, let's start there. Um, but you know, it's a, it's a few years down the line, right. And nobody's paying me to invest my own money. So, you know, it's like, Hey bro, like you writing these checks, but these checks ain't coming back in. Yeah. Yeah. Time. Signing the back of the check or signing the front of the check. I think you'd rather sign the back. <laughs> it's a big, big difference there. And so, you know, that was a big driver of it. But then two, you know, I, as I was learning, I felt like the skills and experiences that I had as a professional athlete and athlete in general were a little bit more in alignment with being an entrepreneur and mm. sitting in a seat on a day-to-day -day basis and committing to something uh, and seeing it through over an extended period of time, i.e. my professional career, or not even my professional, my athletic career. It takes a long time to be a pro athlete, right? Grit, de dedication, all that stuff, uh, commitment. And I felt like you know, after some time, that would be uh, in, more in alignment with the skills that I had developed there. And so in the summer of 2020, I was like, you know what, I need to figure out an opportunity for me to just try it out like a petri dish, if you will. And I'm sure you guys have had a, a bad paper straw experience in your lifetime. And I was like, yo, this is interesting for us, for me to just try some stuff out, see where it goes. Um, and and uh see what i can make of it and so in the summer of 2020 me and my business partner we started an eco-friendly company called swizzle which is essentially two stainless steel straws that come in like this eco-friendly sheet packaging um consumer packaged good e-commerce all that all that jazz and uh we built it into a nice little business didn't take any outside capital i funded it you know out of my own pocket more money out of my pocket but it was a it was a, it was doing a different uh, it was for a different opportunity, uh, but we we built that into a nice little something, uh, achieved national distribution in Target, Ross, TJ Maxx, several, several other retailers, uh, and ultimately sold that business in October of 2020 as I prepared to scale up uh, with Alchemy. So I already got one exit under my belt. So my, my thesis was correct in saying that like, you know, entrepreneurship in the founder seat ain't so bad after all, um, but, you know, I had no desires to really be the, the quote, straw king of the world. And so <laughs> there in lie, like, all right, you know, we got it to a good point. Let's, uh, you know, let's offload it and uh, let's move on to the next thing. Yeah, we usually like to ask this towards the end, but, but since we're on this topic, you know, talking about marrying your athletic passions to then coming into the entrepreneurship seat, being in the driver's seat, were there similarities you found from, what helped you excel in athletics that then you brought into what helped you excel to taking a company from inception to exit? Yeah, I think, you know, it's just the intentionality of like being in the weeds and the nuanced details. Uh, I found myself as, as an investor, like doing very surface level, you didn't have an opportunity to really get deep. And even if you went deep, you didn't stay deep for a long time. It was like, all right, I did this, now I'm on to the next one. Um, you know, and I, I just, I didn't find uh, satisfaction in that. I found satisfaction in saying like, look, this is, you know, my baby, this is one, my creation. Like, you know, that that was a big uh, driver for me as well. It's like, I like to create things um, and, you know, see things that aren't there and say, oh, this would be cool. Um, so that was a big driver for me as well. Um, but all in all, you know, from an athletic perspective, again, kind of sitting in that seat, committing to something over a period of time and really working your craft, uh, I think is a great way to put it. That was uh, <clears throat> ultimately the parallel that I drew between like being an athlete and an actual entrepreneur founder. Yeah, so I mean, I guess on that trend, let's talk about what you're building now. And we'd love to understand because it's at this very interesting time, especially I think as 2020 has been a, a test uh, for a lot of our, our mental wellnesses and mental health and maybe not the year that a lot of us had planned, you know, when we came into the year in 2020. So talk to us about Alchemy, the impetus behind it and the, the problem and customer you're hoping to serve. Yeah, for sure. So um, we, we talked a lot about like this whole transition period during tech lead and swizzle, et cetera. 
Um, you know, so things were going well on the surface, but behind the scenes, I was struggling, you know, facing a lot of anxiety, depression, really just trying to figure life out. I immediately, I, I wasted no time uh, from retirement. And even my retirement, I didn't take any time to properly heal. I had a very jaded relationship with the Chicago Bears. Um, you know, new staff came in. We didn't see eye to eye. I was injured on injured reserve. And I, I retired based off of me not playing a, a, a snap that entire season. So the entire 2015 season, I didn't play not one down. And then I retired in that off season. So it was not like this cer ceremonial exit. Oh, Ryan Mundy, goodbye. Like, no, it was very um, tumultuous to, to say the least. Um, and that left a very bad taste in my mouth. And so, you know, I didn't take the appropriate time to heal. And I was honestly, all the investment activity, I was running from myself. I didn't want anything, excuse me, I didn't want shit to do with football. I'm like, look, I played football my entire life. I don't want to, I don't want to talk about Jay Cutler. I don't want to talk about a Super Bowl. Get away from me. Uh, so I was running from who I was and what I've been doing my entire life. And that wasn't healthy for me either. And ultimately, you know, the anxiety of like figuring things out, trying to fake it till you make it, depression of like the loss factor of what I lost, you know what I mean? Like I wasn't making money anymore, uh, lost my community uh, in the sense of like teammates and that brotherhood, um, loss of like a schedule and system around me. Like there was just a significant loss factor during that transition. And, and uh, ultimately, as mentioned, culminated with anxiety and depression. And I wasn't taking good care of myself. Like I was out of shape, I wasn't eating well, I was frail, weak, lost about 20 pounds or so. So it wasn't cool. Um, and then also during this time as well, uh, my family was going through a laundry list of chronic disease and illness, type two diabetes amputations, um, Alzheimer's and dementia. My grandfather passed away from, my, my father-in-law passed away at an early age from a heart attack. Grandmother had stroke, wasn't able to come to my wedding. Uh, my mother was dealing with some issues. My wife was doing, dealing with anxiety and depression from her father passing away at her early. It was just a lot. And, you know, I put all these experiences into a bucket and just said like, hey, who's like focused on the trajectory of black health? You know, I'm going through what I'm going through, trying to figure out Ryan Mundy 2.0, no longer as Ryan Mundy the athlete, right? Cause I was already running from that person. But the reality is I'll never, there will never not be a day where I'm not a black man. And I needed somebody to kind of fill that void that I that wasn't uh, currently filled. And looking into the marketplace, there was no brand, there was no company, there was no community that was meeting my needs. And then also the needs of my family, right? The black community is the most influential community globally, mm -hmm. driving trends, spending habits, et cetera. But we're also the most sickest or the most sick and at risk community globally for every chronic disease illness. And so there's a huge disconnect there. Um, and so I've been thinking about this idea towards the end of 2019, didn't know where to start, uh, but then 2020 happened uh, and we saw the effects of Corona on the black community. And so I was like, hey, like, what does nutrition look like? How do we make black bodies healthier? That was a concept and idea. And I started down that path. But then the summer of 2020 happened and Black Lives Matter, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, the names go on and on. And I really had to take a big step back and say, well, what is the most pressing need of our community right now, right? The overarching mission of Alchemy is to become the universal healthcare provider for the Black community. But well, where do you start that mission at? Can't build Rome in a day. It's like, what's, what's the right place to start? Um, and ultimately through a lot of like insights and just listening, landed on mental health for sure. And with the fundamental belief in saying that a healthy life starts with a healthy mind. And if we're ever as a community going to unlock our potential, we need to reconcile with our past and our relationship with the health and wellness and the healthcare system uh, to make sure that uh, we could you know, achieve all of our hopes, dreams and aspirations. So again, our mission is to become the universal healthcare provider for the black community. We are rooting that mission in mental health uh, with a vision uh, of a world in which black health disparities are non-existent. So that's you, you, the backstory behind Alchemy. You just touched on so many things. And one thing that stuck out was all of the things the black community faces, many of which born out of racial injustice and inequality, which then leads to 
maybe worse health care or the many other things that the black community is faced with, how do you begin to build a unique set of programming to start to work through all of that and address all of that? It's, you got to take it one step before that. You got to build a unique brand. Um, and that's what I tell people, like our number one product is our brand. Um, you know, we are entering into the self-care, uh, health and wellness space with a different look, a different feel that you just don't see out there, right? And so, again, the driver behind it is establishing that relationship. The Black community and the relationship with the existing healthcare system is very, is checkered at best. Uh, and that's showing up with the vaccines, right? Like we are grossly unvaccinated and we obviously need it the most because we were the most affected by it. But there's a severe lack of trust. And so our number one product is our brand, first and foremost. Uh, but then after that, we start to think about specifically as it relates to mental health and our starting point, like what are the, the barriers that, you know, in, impact one from receiving proper mental health care, right? And looking at the healthcare spectrum as it relates to mental health, there's yoga, there's meditation, and then there's go see a therapist. That's a big ass gap, you know, from, <laughs> from meditation. And that's something that I've, I, I, experience personally, like I could not find a therapist. I could not find somebody that I wanted to talk to about my issues, my problems. And I got resources. Imagine like, what does that look like for somebody who's not as, as resources myself? And so I saw this huge gap that was littered with these access barriers, starting with costs. Therapy is expensive, right? Uh, finding a culturally competent therapist, less than 4% of therapists are of color or uh, minority descent, right? So there's a supply issue. Um, and then if you find somebody scheduling, there may be adverse selection there because all the good ones may be booked up. Uh, and then there's geographic issues. There's so many barriers and hurdles to get and go see a therapist that it was like, man, there needs to be something put in between that helps people. Um, and that's what we're attacking. Uh, and that's what our initial product set will be uh, when we come to market uh, in May. So excited about that. I love your brand and definitely want to encourage our listeners to check out Alchemy Health, both on Instagram and your website, uh, to see that, that brand and imagery and just kind of tone come to life. I think it's awesome. How do you start to then attack and prioritize all of those challenges that you just laid out to be that middleman or, you know, kind of, um, bridge to mental health awareness and better mental health? Yeah, so we think about it and, you know, based off of all those access barriers that I just laid out, we say, like, what makes the most sense here? Um, and so, and, and how do we mitigate a lot of that? And so our initial product set, um, you could think about us as, it's like, not a hodgepodge, but kind of, uh, like Masterclass meets Peloton meets Calm, all in one. Um, you know, masterclass in the sense that we are creating uh, therapy modules that are on demand for uh, consumption, asynchronous consumption, anytime, any place, et cetera. Um, and these, will, these therapy sessions will be led by black clinical professionals around topics that are germane to our community and are tied to a pillar of mental health. Um, in addition to that, we are also launching like a guided meditation product uh, called Waves. And essentially these waves will be led by uh, black mindfulness and meditation uh, experts uh, that bring a different, again, sound to the meditative experience. So, you know, we did a lot of studying around like what's right and what's wrong, not even right and wrong, but like where the issues are as it relates to meditation specifically for the black community. And, you know, carving out value at every, uh, or exploring opportunity at every turn. And so like, what does it look, instead of Headspace having a British fellow, what does it look like to have like a black person leading the guided medicine? It's little stuff like that, the representation portion of it that makes a big, big, big difference with our community, right? And these things aren't rocket science, um, but they're just intentional. And so, um, really thinking about how, how we mitigate the, the access barriers, the cost barriers, et cetera. And so like we're on a subscription-based model where you will be able to, on an annual basis, um, you would have uh, an opportunity to consume unlimited on-demand 
mental health support and content for less than the cost of one in therapy session. And so that's an immediate value proposition for our, our, our community because as I open with, therapy is expensive. Yeah, one of the ways that I think we've we've really seen a shift, I'd say in the last couple of years in healthcare is people going from reactive to preventative. And that's kind of what you're talking about, right? Like, yeah, you can go to therapy and, and deal with trauma that's sort of very acute, but then there's the aspect of, okay, with the little things that build over time. The one challenge I tend to find with, you know, as, as Tim and I uh, look at investment opportunities in this in this category, is it's not always very clear whether the results like are there or, or, or if there's KPIs that are being met, it's not, it's not easy to see if the customer's need is being met because there's no scoreboard. There's no, you know, it's not like a weight loss thing. You can't say, okay, you're down 10 pounds. Great. How do you measure success when it comes to a platform like this so that you know that the customers are, are getting better? Yeah. Well, we actually have a scoring system that we're developing so that people can uh, attribute and quantifiably see because I came to the Alchemy platform, I started here and now I'm here, right? So it's like this self-rating system. Um, but then also as we continue to grow and develop, there are some really interesting opportunities for us in like the B2B space, um, et cetera, where we are reducing costs or that's like the metric for payers, et cetera. And the way that I explain it to people is like, think about therapy as the emergency room. And everybody was like, all right, I need to go to the emergency room because I have this issue. But that was expensive for everybody involved. So what happened? They started introducing medi clinics, right? Go to the, don't go to the emergency room, go to the medi clinic, right? That's gonna help us reduce some of these costs. So in that same vein, everybody's like, oh, I need to go see a therapist. Every issue or just because you're upset doesn't mean that you need to go see a therapist, right? So how, so again, in that same analogy, we're saying that, yeah, there's a time and place for therapy and we're not looking to replace in-person therapy, but there's a lot of stuff that we could do before that step to kind of help you. At least if you need to go to the therapy, you'll be in a better place, right? Or we could circumvent that experience all the way and you don't even need to go to therapy. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there, that's contextually how I look at it. Um, but again, you know, really thinking about how to quantify that and, and it's all about like cost reduction to the payers, et cetera. We're not at that stage just yet, but we're more so just focused on the consumer and saying like, look, you know, when you came to Alchemy, you were here and because you've been on the platform for X amount of months or X amount of experiences, you are now here and that's meaningful to you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And one of the, the differences between this company and the company you started previously, the, the, the Swizzle with straws is that you've actually gone and taken venture capital, which is how, you know, we, we reconnected through one of your investors. Talk to us about that process. What prompted you to say, we want to go the VC route with this business and maybe what a little bit of the fundraising process was like for you having to go through that the first time. Yeah. Um, the VC process kind of found me like I was, you know, 2020 again, took a number. Um, it, it was, it was a doozy, you know, in the, in the first five or six months, I got two young kids. And so just like homeschooling was enough in itself. Uh, so there was a lot of stress in the, in the money household. And I'm trying to figure this out. Like, I just have an idea. I don't know what the product is going to be. I don't know what the business model is. And I'm, you know, trying to figure this thing out on a day-to-day -day basis. And I was like dropping hints to people like, hey, I'm thinking about something in the, in the wellness category specifically for the Black community. Um, and, you know, it sounded interesting, at, at, you know, in, in January and February. People were like, all right, keep us up to date. But then again, the summer 2020 happened, right? And it's a whole new landscape and, and the real issues are on people's radar now. So I started to get some inbound interest. I'm like, hey, Ryan, are you still working on this? Like, you know, can we catch up type thing? Um, and that was really like the jump start uh, of like the VC process. It was always a part of the plan. I, you know, but I wasn't planning on it um, happening the way that it happened in late June, July. And so like, I kind of got thrust into it because I got pulled into it. So I was like, all right, I guess I'll do it now. Um, but it was it, it was um, it was a good experience. That was my first rodeo raising any type of money. Uh, so there was a lot of learnings there um, and, and it has prepared me for moving forward. Uh, I've already got like a very strong plan uh, about this next round. Uh, but the first time around, it was interesting uh, because again, I just had an idea. And I was like, hey, I want to do something to change the plight of Black health. 
Um, and it was more so about the belief in me and the belief in the idea than it was about any model or anything like that. Did being an investor before as an angel investor help you as you were talking, you know, being on the other side of the table, did it change the way you approach those conversations? Um, it, it was helpful because I know a lot of people, right. And that's the biggest thing for entrepreneurs raising money is like, who do you know, what's your relationship like with them? So I knew a lot of people, right. And so like getting meetings and getting on people's radar was pretty efficient. Uh, that was the biggest, uh, help as far as like negotiation that, that was, um, yeah, I guess that was helpful too. Yeah. But when I was investing in the companies, like I wasn't able, you know, I'm writing small, I'm not leading rounds, I'm not doing any of that. So I'm just taking the terms as they are, you know what I mean? So I didn't have much influence or sway there. Um, but again, that, that experience was still helpful. Though. How does taking on venture capital reframe, if, if at all, your approach to the company or your aspiration for how big it can become? I look at venture, you know, once you get on a venture treadmill, really hard to get off. Um, and you have to, there's no, I don't look at it as a negative, but you have to really understand what you're signing up for. And I used to tell entrepreneurs this, I'm like, hey man, like once you take venture money, you plan a different game. Um, and so you just need to know what you're signing up for. As it relate, and, and that really fueled my, I would say that my experience with Swizzle really fueled my paradigm because I figured out how to build a business, a profitable business without venture money, right? And so that experience was equally helpful. But it, as it relates to this, like I'm looking to move fast. I'm looking to hit hard and hit often. And I think venture money is definitely good for that. And just the sheer size of the opportunity. Like when I say this is a white space, no pun intended, this is a white <laughs> space, I promise you. And so we have a very unique opportunity to hit hard, hit fast. And so I'm hustling uh, day in and day out to achieve that. Uh, and I, you know, like who doesn't want to be like Bumble or who doesn't want to have like a $2 billion? Like I want that, right? And, and not only, and it's in full alignment with my value system because this is an amazing opportunity for like, to do well from a business perspective, but then also to make an impact um, that is generational. Like I'm building alchemy to be something that, you know, my kids, my grandkids can use, right? This is not a one year solve. This is not a two year solve. This is not even a 10 year solve. You know, this is like a legacy type company that I'm building here. And that's the approach that I'm taking to it day in and day out. Yeah, and you mentioned those aspirational outcomes like a billion dollar exit or multi-billion dollar exit. And in that sense, it's it's not too dissimilar, I imagine, from football in that, like, it's not like one day you just lace them up and you're playing in the Super Bowl. Like, you had to take a process-oriented approach every single day getting better to have that opportunity. And I'm curious if that has influenced your approach as an entrepreneur, where it's really being able to focus on the everyday versus just solely, you know, getting lost in in the dream. Well, there is a little caveat because I won the Super Bowl my rookie year with the Steelers. <laughs> Fair enough. So I just kind of showed up and and, and did win. Um, but on on a serious note, yeah, I mean that's why I got in on the other side of the table because it's really about refining the craft um, and and being committed to to see it through over a period of time. Um, you know, I started playing football when I was seven, and I didn't stop until I was thirty one. And the great thing about football is that there's no matter how well you play, there's always an opportunity to improve or to do something better. Um, and that's the approach that I take, you know, with with uh, with business and specifically building alchemy. Am I perfect? By no means. Like you could probably go to YouTube right now and and see me, you know, having some pretty embarrassing plays on my resume, right? But the reality is, you know, you get up and you play the next play, and that's how I'm approaching. Um, you know, building this company. It, it won't be perfect. It won't always be pretty, but my focus is on the mission and the vision and, and bringing that to life and building the team around that and having the right stakeholders in the boat to help me achieve that. Well, and it also just shows how far you've come going from being one of the hardest hitters in the league, you know, getting fined for hits. And now here you are, you've, you've started a mental health and wellness company. That's pretty cool. Yeah, it, it is important. Um, you know, and I think there's a, there's, there's a really important uh, 
message within that specifically going back to the transition that transition is hard like i told y'all like you know I, I went to school all throughout my career and you know thought i was doing something by preparing but it's a lot different when the rubber meets the road for sure and you know the 30 for 30 broke docuseries and all that stuff that's out there that doesn't have to be the reality you know but that's the story that gets painted uh, most broadly, and that's what people think about when they think about athletes getting into business. But the reality is, you know, between like, you know, who you are as a person, and that's really what I had to do. It's like, look, I'm not running into people anymore, and I'm not hitting people hard to your point anymore. But think about what allowed me to do that. You know, grit, determination, hard work, you know, all those adjectives that allowed me to do put in that physical work. That's who I am at my core. So the opportunity is to put in the work to figure out how to pick up and repurpose those intangibles or intrinsic uh, assets and values and put them into a new context and then take off again. Well, and the biggest thing of it is that you're still here doing it, right? And you've got the uh, the guys with the Twitter fingers doubting you. And 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 I'll I'll you know say the mea culpa. I think when you first announced your fund. I probably was, was, you know, jawing on Twitter and saying, oh, here's another, you know, athlete investor. And Tim and I talk about, I mean, that's probably been, I don't know, five years since then, the evolution that, that I've personally gone on in, in exploring this topic. And to see you, I think, building right along with it. Um, one, uh, if it's worth anything, just wanted to, to apologize now, now that we're here face to face. There it is, Jay. <laughs> but, but also say that, you know, uh, I, I do truly believe this, that you are pioneering something. I think it's not just about guys coming out and saying investing is the only path that I have. It's that you're building the blueprint to say, I see a problem. I believe that I can be part of the solution. And then, you know, putting your head down and, and, and going right after it. And so I think, you know, that's something that's really to be commended. Yeah, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's just not binary, right? Like, you know, there and there's there's space across. We can look at it as a spectrum, right? And everybody wants to say let. And the people used to approach me with this, like they wanted me to start a fund, go get your friends, we'll aggregate the athlete dollar, and we'll go invest it. Yeah, okay, I hear you. But nobody's really done it successfully, right? So there's a reason for that. Like, who has who has really done that? But I think that's just thinking about it too narrowly. Right. And just saying like, hey, we're just going to figure out how to get athletes to spend their money better. I don't I don't know if that's really the solve. Right. Like there there needs to be, you know, a little bit more thoughtfulness, a little bit more intentionality and in saying like, hey, how do we make better human beings as a part of that transition? Not to say like, hey, give me your money and I'm going to put it here. Um, that's way too surface level. And that, I don't think that gets at the core. And I'm always trying to get to the core of the issue. Like, what is the core of the issue here? That does not get at the core, right? And, and so, yeah, I think it's just a spectrum. We got guys like Kelvin Beachum, Derek Morgan, Will Allen. I mean, all these guys, and the crazy thing, like all these guys are my teammates, um, which I think is an interesting story in itself. But um, there's guys out there changing their narrative and I'm just happy to be in community with them. Yeah, no, well, we, uh, we appreciate you taking the time to chat with us today. You know, one place that, we love to close uh, is just words of advice, but we'll flip it a little bit. Um, would love to know if knowing what you know now about investing, about starting a company, if there is some advice that you would like to give your younger self. Ooh, that's a good one. Um, don't sell your Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> you you can give my younger self that advice too. <laughs> was, it was a year doing that whole the, the tech leap process where I was deep into crypto. I mean, I had all sorts of assets. I was day trading. This is like 2017, right? Yeah. Before this was a, like I was deep into it. Um, yeah. Finance, Bitrix, Coin. I was on it all. Cranking, all of that. Uh, I had rigs um, that were mining for me. Yeah, I was. I was wow. Pretty, yeah, I was. And that, that's what that was back when we thought twenty thousand was like the number to break, right? And <laughs> thousand isn't going to get there. Just boom. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I still have a little bit, but not nearly as much as I was that I had when I was actively like in it day to day. Yeah. Well, look, fair enough, Ryan. I think one, uh, that is good advice that sometimes things just take longer to get to fruition. But, you know, more, more importantly, it's that um, I think you know, we know a lot of entrepreneurs that listen to the show. I think it's just really great advice to say, 
when you find a problem that, that you're really excited about that you feel like is your calling to go and, and solve it. And like you said, take a long-term approach. I mean, that's the, the biggest thing that we learn. Um, that's just always great advice for, for our listeners to hear. So uh, we want to thank you again for that. Yeah. And then also, you know, long-term approach, but you really got to be passionate about it, right? Like just don't be in it for a buck. Um, there's a lot of different ways to make some money, but it, it really has to align with your value system. The reality is the shit's going to get hard. Right. And on those hard days, you know, you may want to quit because it's not in alignment or you're not as passionate about it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Ryan, for joining us in the game plan. We look forward to having you back on once you guys have launched and uh, you can come and tell us how those things are going and when you're getting ready for your next uh, fundraise. So we thank you so much for joining us on the game plan today. All good. Appreciate you guys. Thanks, Ryan.